Hey everybody, it's Tiny Tom Logan back with another video for you. Probably my first video back for a while for the regulars that's actually taken a fair amount of testing. So I've been lucky enough to get my hands on the 3990X, the behemoth of a 64 core, 128 thread, $4,000 processor. Yeah. Now, I uh, have been waiting ages to get my hands on this, and I have been super excited about it as well. Now, because I'm a little bit late to the part, it does mean there's a lot of information out there already. So, what I decided to do is, everyone seems to have tested it on the Zenith 2 Extreme, because it is the new board that Asus have brought out specifically for the processor. And basically, what they've done is they took the 870 amp PWMs, MOSFETs, whatever you want to call them, um, and they've upped them to pretty much industrial grade 90 amp ones. So still got eight of them. They are still parallel wired. So it's pretty much the same board with but just those extra 20 amps on each of them. But then it made me think, how bad would the original Zenith have performed with it on there anyway? And then, I, then once I'd tested that, I thought to myself, well, I might as well get the Creator and the Aorus Extreme out, considering I still had those as well. So what we ended up doing was having a good old VRM dig on these to see what the temperatures were like. But then also, I got the other Threadripper processors back, and I've run some tests on the uh, 60, the 3960X and the 3970X as well. And I've got some side-by-side -side performance malarkey to show you as well. So hopefully this will be a little bit more interesting than the way I normally would have done it. So yes, the way I normally would have done it is I would have done it on the same board that I would have done originally, which would have been the original Zenith. But then, with all the extra cores and the fact that compared to the even the 3970X, we've got twice the processor because we've gone from 32 cores up to a monstrous 64 cores. I thought I'd kind of mix it up a bit, but I also wanted to do some background digging and see how that went as well. Now, you can go to the OC3D website with a click link underneath and go and explore all the graphs if you're actually interested in the nitty gritty. You can see the VRM temps of all the boards side by side. You can see all the Cinebench stuff. You can see all of the other tests, all the IDA stuff, all the Sandra stuff, the HEVC stuff, the X265 stuff, although technically that's kind of the same thing but you get my meaning. There's also a bit of gaming going on in there as well. Now, don't get me wrong, I know this isn't a 4,000 pound gaming processor. Let's face facts, it'd have to be running at seven gigahertz if it was gonna be a four grand gaming processor, and even then you'd probably still need to be nuts to wanna buy it. But, on point with this behemoth of what is effectively a content creator stroke gamer at the weekends kind of dream. And in, if you think about that, with these current moment in times, with me uh, filming this in the middle of April, in the middle of lockdown, this could be the kind of guy that's used to sending all of his stuff off to like a big server farm or something when he's at work, to a actually be able to create some sort of stuff with this processor at home. Now, I know that's not gonna have people rushing out to go and buy them so that they can build a home office, but we can all sit and dream, can't we? Now, the thing with this, um, processor, like I said, it's twice the processor. So then it had me thinking, would it be twice the power? And if I'm completely honest, when you run it as stock, no, it's not. And if I, it actually had me at that point a little bit surprised because when you do run it as stock, at least compared to the uh, 70 and the 60, they weren't that far apart when you consider the actual uh, core differences. Now, the core differences aside, a lot, a part of the way that they get around the fact of it not using so much power is with an all-core boost, it is a little bit lower. So with mine, all-core boost at stock, I was hitting around the 2.6, so 2.7 to 2.8 gigahertz mark, which does sound a little bit low, but when you consider the fact that there's 64 of them going on and in with big number crunching machines, 3D render farms, all of that sort of stuff, the cores are normally where uh, you get your performance from. Now, 
when you do open the taps on this processor, the, the requirements for the uh, wattage and the you know, amount of power it's actually going to be pulling is significantly different to the way it is at stock. You can almost get it to be running almost double the wattage just by overclocking it. Now, with overclocking it, I have heard that people have had some difficulties with it. And if you go about it in the normal manner, I didn't get very far with it either. Um, so 3.6 gigahertz was doable within the realms of the cooling that I was using, which is the Cooler Master specific TR4 uh, cooler, 360 millimeters. And then I also had three um, Corsair MLs on it as well, which got up to 2,400 RPM. And for the overclocking, I was running everything at maxi chat. Now at 3.6, it was kind of feasible. But when I got it up to uh, 3.8, things were getting toasty at that point. And this was part of the reason why I was starting to get a little bit nervous because I had kind of some expectations and they were extremely wildly overfounded expectations where I was hoping I might have got four gigahertz on all of them. But things got incredibly hot at that point. We're talking over 100 degrees. It was ri ridiculous. Even the radiator on the uh, cooler was getting warm within no time whatsoever. So I had to rethink my strategy. And so I rethought, rethought my strategy. I actually did something that I don't really do a lot, and that is I left the volts completely alone. Leaving the volts completely alone brought the temperatures down a little bit because effectively what you normally do with an overclock is you put your voltage in that you think it's going to need and uh, then you put your multiplier in. Uh, well, I ended up bringing my uh, voltage down and down and down and down and down, got my temperatures down reasonably, but then things started getting unstable. So I was like, I'm just gonna see what's gonna happen if I leave them alone on the system now I don't normally do that because I don't like letting my system do what it wants, really. But with the way the AMD processors are going at the moment, especially with the way that the cores do fluctuate so much, I was like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll give it a try. And um, I left it on its own and it did come down a little bit, but I still wasn't happy. They were still incredibly warm. So then I started looking at Precision Boost Overdrive. Now, I'm not sure whether it was something that... Um, I was doing specifically wrong, but with Precision Boost Overdrive, if you go into Precision Boost Overdrive, it maximizes all of the settings that you have at the top for you when you go in to change it and then you have to start bringing them down. With it left uh, on its, to its own devices, just enabling Precision Boost Overdrive, which had all of them turned up to the hilt, I was actually finding some instability issues. So I decided to go about that a different way as well. So I actually took the uh, software off my PC and then I went to the BIOS. So what I did is in the BIOS you can find on the ASUS board you can find a setting f just for Precision Boost Overdrive and one of the settings is quite simply motherboard and it is the motherboard limits for Precision Boost Overdrive just enabled. It, 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 they're max so they're not manually um, you're not going in and changing anything so I, I tried that and I found stability. So then what I did is I also went back to the BIOS and there's an option for you to put a 200 megahertz boost onto the clock, whether that be uh, all core boost or then maximum boost. So I was like, okay, I'll give that a try. So I did that and I was getting some rather crazy numbers at that point, quite close to the numbers I was getting at around the 3.8 gigahertz mark. But as you'll see in some of the clips in a, in a minute, that I was actually at that point getting all core boosts around the kind of 3.6, 3.7 mark, sometimes even seeing cores flicking up to eight, but I was getting 4.4, sometimes 4.5 for single core boost stuff as well. So we had a marked um, performance increase in all of them with just two setting changes. So at this point, I thought to myself, I'm not going to just cook my processor because it's too much money's worth to put at risk of it being overheated and run for a day at over 100 degrees. So I thought I'm going to be a little bit more cautious with this one and I'm going to give these two simple setting changes 
a go. So our interjecting, because we were talking about power, but with, because of power, that leads us on pretty much straight away to VRM temperatures. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to give the VRM temperatures a look across the board with these is because Asus obviously brought out the new board and then it makes you wonder whether the old board wasn't really capable of it. Now, the, the Asus boards have both got little fans on the VRMs and they're meant to kick in about 60 degrees and then the more they warm up, the more they spin up. One of the things I will say though, with the 3990X and the 3970X, by the time you actually get those VRMs that hot, you can pretty much guarantee that uh, even with a 360 millimeter AIO, that your processor is going to be incredibly warm anyway. And because your processor is gonna be incredibly warm, it's gonna mean that the fans on your cooler are going to spin up and you are never going to hear these. Because even if you manually force them on, uh, and I've tried them with a, a range of um, uh, thermal resistors in there, so resistors in there, and then I also got a little Noctua one with the fan speed uh, adjust on it so I could turn it up and down and they're not actually that loud. Yes you can definitely hear them because they're small and they are moving air but they're not annoyingly whiny or anything like that and then also like I said by the time that your CPU fans are actually cranked up anyway it's lost in the ether and you'd struggle to pick them out. So they're not as bad as I thought and I was one of the people that looked at them and was like oh god they're gonna be horrific. Anyway so the Alpha, clearly the coolest across the board, didn't even really make a great deal of difference with the um, uh, overclock in place either, kind of just took it in its stride. But when you look at that, look at the uh, original Zenith as well, and that did better than I was expecting it to be. I was thinking that the reason why they brought the Alpha out was because the original uh, Extreme just wasn't going to be good enough. And I think they've kind of done it just to prove a point that they have a significantly better board because the other two do have 16 phases and it doesn't seem to have done a massive amount of difference. It's still the same amount of load, so you could be saying that's still the same amount of heat. But with a PWM, um, they run cooler if they're rated higher. So yeah it's it's a bit of a kind of um a balancing act with that one and i will say that they weren't as cool in comparison as i was expecting to the original zenith so those against the original zenith i actually thought the original zenith with the 3990x did quite a bit better but obviously you've got the temperatures there for all of the other processors as well because i went and retested all of them because i'm a complete madman so you'll get an awful lot of data there but in reality i can quite honestly say that yes the alpha is the best of the bunch but it should be because of the price but also it makes me wonder why they did it because in reality i actually think the original zenith was really good and it makes me wonder whether they got a bit shaky about it but I think this might be one of the rare times recently where ROG has actually done what ROG wanted to do. And I don't mean price gouge, charge you loads more money for something. I mean actually push the envelope that little bit more because those three boards all have the same v, uh, VRMs. And they are the 70 amp ones. I can't remember the name off the top of my head because I should have written it down, but I never write a script. Um, and they all run the same ones apart from those two have 16 and then that one just has eight and then they're parallel wired out into eight power sorry 16 power phases this one they upped the ante though and like i said it then was exactly the same apart from they dialed the amps up from 70 to the 90 amp models and yeah but like i said i think that was rog doing what rog used to be really really well known for with things like the Aries and the Mars when they did things just because they could. I think this is one of those things. Yes, they are gonna remove your left kidney and your right testicle, all booby, depending on what sex you are. Not getting into that argument. But it's an awful lot of board for the money. But other than that, everything else is pretty much the same. So you're gonna to have to decide whether you want that spec list you know, on your forum and uh, when you're talking about your rig or whether you might just want to save the money and buy a water block instead.
Now, first and foremost, what I want to do is I want to show you Cinebench. And then with Cinebench, what you're going to do is you're going to see the start of Cinebench to the 3990X. And then when the 3990X is complete, it's then going to cut into 3970X. And then when that one's complete, it's going to cut into the 3960X. So you're going to get a chance to see the performance difference in a very visual way with those. I've also done it with Blender, but even um, our Blender run, which uh, is 4 million polygons, and our 4K run took this just, well, it was under five minutes it took it, but obviously you're not going to want to sit there and watch box, boxes go for five minutes. So I've done some big, big editing, which again is quite unique for me, just to give you an idea again about the differences between the two so that you can get a very visual representation on just how much extra this thing can chew through when you really want to load it up. So Cinebench, I've already clicked the button and what it's going to do in a second is go black and then it's going to show you 64 little boxes whizzing around like absolute no one's business because it does this insanely fast. When it does flick to the next one, that's literally going to be the point that the 3970X would have been at before it finished the same one. And then we click straight into the 3960X as well. Now, yes, that was a very fast change, but what you do need to remember is it's actually not that quick a run either. And when the graph comes up, it's really quite easy to see how much it's decimated the competition, where they're obviously they're all going to be at the top, but it's just when you start picking down through the graphs to try and find something that says Intel. Now Blender, again, 64 boxes at the start. But what I have done is rather than us watching the four minutes out of this, I've cut it really nice and quickly. And then this is our four million polygon test. And you can see at the end that we have a five minutes and 17 seconds for the stock 3990X. And then we flick into where the 3970X would have been and Blender takes quite a while. And then that's where the 3960X would have been. So at this point, when I bring the graph up, it actually goes to show you quite how insane that processor really is, because there is an awful big difference between the two. And you have to kind of zoom in to be able to see where these all kind of fit in, because there is a massive amount of difference there. But even the amount of difference that we managed to eke out of just that silly overclock, you know, that didn't really do a great deal, we still managed to take 20 seconds off of that render. It's insane. Now don't forget, you can go to the Overclock 3D website, and I am trying to whittle through this as quickly as I possibly can do, but at the same time give you, like I said, some really good visual representations on the performance. You can also see some of the extra graphs that I'm going to chuck up now, just so that you can get a uh, better idea on what has been going on. But at the end of the day, with the 3990X, and unbelievable the scores I was getting, and weirdly, this is another thing. Uh, if you look really carefully at the Cinebench run, that you go back and have a look at it, you'll see it went over thirty thousand. Now I couldn't get it to go over thirty thousand when I first got it with the tweaks, and I don't know what it is, but over the last couple of days, it has been getting consistently quicker, and I don't know why. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen to you guys. I've been testing in a thermally controlled room, so I've actually been making sure that the room has been 20 degrees, and it's kind of perplexed me a little bit. Now, it's, it can be run tolerances, so that one was a 30,000, and then the other one was just below 30,000, but close enough that it was further enough away from when I did the original testing. Um, and I didn't want to go back and backtrack and retest everything again, and I don't know what it is, because I've not changed anything, it just seems to have got marginally quicker. Now, I love that. If it's bedding in, which is, with processors, not theoretically impossible, but it's highly unlikely, but I just like the fact that it might be getting a bit better. Um, and it, it did just make me smile that it's kind of already got its own little weird personality. Anyway, 64 cores. If you are genuinely going to be loading this thing up, it's insanely fast, but it's also an awful lot more monies worth like more expensive than even the model below it which is the 3970x it's obviously just going to be someone for someone that genuinely needs 
all of those extra minutes and seconds that this thing can actually deliver you if you are going to load up all of those cores. If you are like me, for argument's sake though, and you're just going to end up rendering videos on it with Vegas, then it's probably not going to do you that many favours, or at least not with the codec that we used in the review. Um, it is something that I'm going to look at in my spare time and have a little bit of a play around with though, because we do seem to have hit a little bit of a plateau with uh, Vegas now, even where, where we are, even when we are loading it right up and uh, having many, many files in there and transitions and all that sort of stuff. And I think there may be some ways that I can go and have a look at codecs and see if there's a way that I can stress it out a little bit more. But I have always known that uh, Vegas does like uh, clock speed as well as cores. Premiere Pro, for example, though, you can get that to absolutely batter your cores and it definitely does utilize a processor better than Vegas does. But again, that's just the difference between two programs and it's not really something for me to sit here and review two video editing programs. But the, uh, the 3990X in reality is AMD's crowning product and it is in a really massive way, a massive, massive middle finger kind of like French salute, however you want to pronounce it, AMD shoving it to Intel because the performance difference between this and anything Intel has done for years is just mind boggling. And it, the other thing to think about with this is this is, yes, we have kind of have got an epic processor now that they've let us have in the kind of mainstream Threadripper market, but this just absolutely blows anything Intel has away with the fairies. Uh, and it gives it to us in a way that you can still have this processor, have enough clock speed that you can still be able to play games if you want, and you're going to be multitasking. But also with the, uh, the fact that the cores boost and do all those things as well, you wouldn't be getting such a performance, a drastic performance decrease that you may have seen with some of the Xeons. It's amazing. and. Yes, I do love it. I'm turning into a little bit of a fanboy. I almost had all the lights and everything on orange. Um, I know some of the blue boys are now going to go nuts about the fact that Tom actually likes a Threadripper. But if you think about it, Tom's actually liked them for an awful long time because every time I get one, I love them that little bit more. And this is weirdly one of those processes that when it lands, it kind of sets off loads of things in your head about what can I do with this and what can I do with that? How can I cool it? I genuinely want to see whether I can get more performance out of it with custom water cooling. And there's a case over there that now is waiting for custom water cooling so I can do it. It actually has managed to get me all excited. Maybe I've needed that for a little while though and the regulars will know what I mean. But I hope you've enjoyed the numbers that I've given you on this. I actually hope that you've enjoyed the fact that we put the boards all head to head and uh, we've got a little bit of um, data from that as well because the original Zenith didn't do as bad as I thought and I did think it was going to do a lot worse than that in reality. Um, it was perfectly usable. You could have got away with it with decent airflow. I genuinely think you could use that on a daily basis as one of these and some of the numbers were a little bit more surprising considering the price differences with some of the others. Uh, but clearly the Zenith Extreme Alpha out of the four boards is the Halo product. It's definitely the best that there is. And it kind of shows that you don't necessarily need 16 power phases to be able to deliver this much power and stay cool. And yes, if we're going to be talking about the boards, yes, the Asus does have little fans on the top. But in reality, with this processor, by the time the uh, little fans on that board might be spinning, your CPU fans already going absolutely crazy anyway, you're trying to keep this thing cool. So that's another reason why I kind of want to come back with some proper water cooling, big fat radiator, nice flow, all of that sort of stuff to see how much difference we can get out of it again. But then I'm going to want to do um, full cover water blocks because you can get them for this. I think EK do them for the extreme as well, actually. I'm not sure about the creator yet, but I know EK do them for this and it fits that as well. So there are plenty of options. And that's another thing as well. If you did go full water block, so the EK have a full cover one, and you have the full cover one, which is then going to keep the VRMs cool for you as well, you actually don't need that one at that point. 
or then get past with that one and save yourself a few quid. They're not going to like me for telling you that, but if you go down that road, and it doesn't matter what processor you have either, because, uh, it will, like I said, water block, that and that will be absolutely fine. So there's quite a bit of information there for you, quite random, but it's also first one back for me for a little while. So I'm going to love you and leave you and say this is the tiniest one with the absolutely jaw-droppingly good 3990X out. Thank <laughs> you.